so no so first i should um i should acknowledge um i should do a land acknowledgement um i'm on the unceded coast salish territory of the squamish Musqueam, and slur to people um these are stolen lands um and 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 you know wow i mean look at look at this group it's uh it's it's a it's a huge group i you know i've been following as 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 people have been joining and and it's been super exciting to uh to know that I'm going to be reaching a new audience today and some people that I've never talked to before. I'm, I'm so grateful um, that you, you're taking time out of your day to, to be here um, and to hear some of my ideas. I think uh, whenever I have a chance to reach new people, it's always something that's, uh, that's really special for me. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and have a lot of gratitude to all of you for being here as well. Um, big thank you to to Calgary UX, of course. Um, you know, I was scrolling through my social media, and Calgary UX came up, and I was looking at it, and I was like, you know what? I think I want to be a part of that. And 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 then, bada bing, here I am. Of course, it's never anything that easy. Um, there's always uh, a process, but um, but it's been really smooth, and and I feel like uh, I've just naturally. Uh, 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 arrived here um, with all of you, so I think that's a good way to start. Um, and uh, I'm super excited for today. Um, of course, what you're here for today is Unique Ways of Prototyping, um, which is a talk workshop that I often give at conferences and universities and meetups. Um, during pandemic, of course, it shifted a bit, so I was giving it in VR, in, uh, in Oculus VR, virtual reality, in Microsoft's uh, social environment called Altspace. Um, I gave it as a, a featured event there um, for almost a year. Um, and I even gave it in my neighborhood community center um, to kids, um, and that was super interesting. I never kind of talked to kids about, you know, about, about prototyping before, um, so that was super fun. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really an evolving thing. Um, it started as unique ways of prototyping. That's the original and that's what you're getting today. Um, but it's evolved from there. Um, it evolved first into unique ways of making because prototyping was too scary a word for a lot of people. And so we just use unique ways of making. Um, it evolved into unique ways of prototyping for idea validation. And that was great for researchers. They were able to understand it in that way. Um, to be honest, it's still a little bit hard for me to understand it in that way, but it, it seemed to connect with people in that way. When I reached the academic audiences, it became more complex. So it was unique ways of prototyping for instigating change and unique ways of prototyping for um, amplifying voice. And, and it continues to evolve. I think right now it's just being called unique ways. Um, and that kind of unique ways terminology is an umbrella for all of this. Um, and it kind of points a little bit to the entrepreneurial aspect of this. Um, I've been asked recently about the entrepreneurial angle and, um, and how I would scale or monetize this. Of course, that was never my intention. I just wanted to reach people, to connect with people, to share my ideas. And that's what it's about for me. But of course, you know, when you're, when you're prompted about, about entrepreneurship and things like that, you need some sort of response. And so, and so it ends up um, being at this point of just being unique ways right now. Um, you know, to give you an overview of how this goes, um, the talk portion um, has a bit of a part where I just talk about what inspired this. Um, the second part of the talk is the really useful part, the part that you can apply, um, which is kind of the tenets of unique ways of prototyping. So it's kind of a process that you can apply to any creative project that you're doing. Um, after that, we'll go into a workshop portion, which is fun and easy, and it doesn't require any um, abilities or anything like that. Everybody can do it, and it works really well in Zoom with the breakout rooms, actually. Um, so we'll do the workshop, and then we'll go into a QA. and a And with this Q&A, you know, you know to, to give you an idea, I'm all about tangents. I love like off topic ideas and like random stuff. So if you have random off topic ideas, please share those too in the Q&A. And of course, if you have more focused ideas, share those as well. I'm very open and I'm very uh, confident that we can uh, address all these in an excellent way. And so uh, that's kind of what it'll be the talk, the workshop and then a Q&A. Um, does that sound okay? Great, great. 
Um, I'm used to people using the, the emojis, but yeah, there we go. Okay, got an emoji, okay, um, great. So, um, so I'll start. So this all started in 2018 when I was an assistant professor um, in India in near Mumbai, and I was writing on a whiteboard with a whiteboard pen. And many of you probably feel like this already, but that time in 2018 with the whiteboard pen was the first time I really realized that writing with a whiteboard pen was actually prototyping. I never thought of simply writing as prototyping before, but it was in that scenario, that's what it was for me. And that was really kind of like a aha moment for me. Um, the second time would have been when I gave my TEDx talk in 2019 at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. I gave my talk and we assembled in the hall to chat about it. And I was with a couple other people, another TEDx speaker and an audience member. And we were kind of chatting about the talks. And, um, and you know, and when you chat, you have ideas and, and, and through voice, sonically through sound, they come into the world. And I realized that a simple conversation was actually a way of prototyping using voice. And that was, of course, I was a bit, I was a bit like, this is just a conversation, but why am I having these ideas? And then the last time, the, the last inspiration point would have been um, in Bangalore at the UX India conference uh, a few years ago. Um, I was on a panel um, at, with deans and, and professors, design professors, and we're chatting. And, um, and there was an impartial note taker there who was writing down all of our ideas that we were sharing or making sticky notes and having this bigger conversation taking turns saying ideas, having the ideas written down in different ways. And I realized that um, through different forms of writing, many, a couple of forms of writing and, um, and, and various people speaking, this was a more complex form, just using voice and writing, a more complex form of prototyping. And that was a real jumping off point for me. And, and I knew it was something I had to share. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll share my slide deck now um, and kind of try to go into this next portion um, of the talk. And if I have my technical abilities, I can just do this. Let's see here. And so I'll quickly just go into the tenets. Um, you know, this first slide is, uh, is in Vancouver in the Microsoft building, I'm giving the same talk and workshop. This is the workshop portion. Um, I'm very used to giving it in person and it's been kind of bizarre to do it over Zoom. Um, but this would have been at the Vancouver User Experience Research Meetup um, at Mobify. Um, they have a great space there for, um, for, for talks and, uh, and for this sort of thing. Um, you know, unique ways of prototyping is 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 what we're talking about, and kind of to go through it, um, it is it is a talk workshop, but it's also something more. It's a creative process. It's tenets. It's it's a number of bullet points that you can apply to your process. Um, it came about actually at that conference in Bangalore, but in a workshop that I attended there around role play. Um, and, and, and I attended that workshop and had a great time. And I was like, you know what, this, I can't leave this in India. I have to bring this back to Canada. And so, and so here I am sharing, sharing it with you. What is it now? Again, it's just unique ways now, um, but often it is referred to as unique ways of prototyping. And it's essentially a process. And there are five pillars to this process, five kind of key points um, you know, um, these kind of happened in a haphazard way. I just kind of stumbled on each one and was like, yeah, that one's good. And that one's good. And that one's good. Um, you'll probably see a lot of overlap with other people's big ideas. Um, things like design thinking will come up. 
Um, and you might think um, about maybe Donald Norman and the design of everyday things. These kinds of ideas are, are in here but they're not ideas that I copy. They're actually ideas that I happen to stumble upon myself as a practicing designer and as a, as a design educator. Um, so, um, so super interesting in that you can just kind of magically arrive at the same ideas as other people, not because you saw their ideas, but because designers kind of do that. The starting point is, um, is, is around the former president of Emily Carr, University of Art and Design, Ron Burnett, um, and his, um, his ideas around their new campus at Great Northern Way. Um, you know, Ron, Ron Burnett um, 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 was really um, fundamental in creating a, a library there, a new kind of library. And uh, in the library, um, you kind of move between these different spaces and those spaces are modalities and, uh, and the different spaces give you different ideas. I'll go into this in more detail shortly, but basically um, it's this idea that you can, you can move between modalities and have different ideas. Research ends up being a big portion. Again, I don't understand, I'm a graduate student and I don't understand what research is. I can honestly tell you, I, I, I wouldn't know how to tell you if something is research or not. But I think through the user experience research meetup and presenting there and getting buy-in from a lot of UX researchers on this process, I think that it is research. And I think it, that that's an important enough point that I can include it within these five pillars. I'm a huge fan of the strategizer books. The value proposition book in particular is one that I love. You know, it's more for entrepreneurship or small business or startups, but um, but I like I like the value proposition canvas and I like looking at it um, in a way that we first understand people, we first understand pains and gains of people, we first understand problems or opportunities of people. And based on understanding people, we create something, a product or a service. So we don't actually start with a product or service. We don't be like, we're not like, I want to make this app. We're like, this is this person. What's the ideal thing for this person? And that people first methodology is hugely important in what I do. Iterative. So a bit like design thinking, except much more iterative um, and works in a cyclical way based on time. And again, I'll get into that in more detail. And visibility, which is, you know, everybody knows in UX we're writing on sticky notes and putting them on the wall. But what happens when you do that is the ideas that are in your head um, become kind of public domain. They're available for everyone to look at and to see and to share. And that's a huge switch. Um, I think a lot of people have a lot of great ideas, maybe too many, that are all trapped in their head. And we need to make those ideas visible in a way. We need to be able to share those ideas as from the real world, from them being um, accessible to everybody. When I talk about modalities, it's about moving between spaces. So in a library, you have books and book stacks where you get the books, right? And then you have rooms where you chat with your colleagues or other students, and maybe you move between getting books and then going and sharing them in the rooms, then getting more books and sharing them in the rooms again. And as you move between those two spaces, you're moving between modalities. And when you do that, you kind of get inspiration. Of course, we can add computers and Wikipedia to that in libraries these days. And this gives us three spaces within libraries that we can move between to get new ideas. And of course, in the middle is the sweet spot. I don't have an infographic for research because I don't have a way of explaining research um, because I don't know how to explain it. So maybe you guys can help me with this, but I do know that it's important and it belongs here. This is the value proposition canvas um, from Strategizer, um, minimized in a big way, um, but just talking about how we understand people before we design for them. This is design thinking that we all know. And rather than use design thinking as we know it, I eliminate some parts. And, um, and I just include this iterative part, um, this cyclical part, which, uh, which looks something like this. 
Um, we, we come up with ideas, we make something and we show them to people. And then we come up with new ideas and make something and show them to people again. And we do this again and again, as long as we have time for, you know, I, I, I eliminated the empathy. I, I think empathy is a, is a natural trait of, uh, of designers. I think that's who we are and how we grow up. And I think we don't need a phase for it. So I, I modify design thinking into just an iterative portion, um, which, is only, um, which is only defined by time and how much time we have, how limited time we have. And visibility, you know, put things on sticky notes, write them on letter-sized pages and put them on the ground so we everybody can read them. Bring your friends over, say, look at these, look at these papers, look at this, read this, read this, what do you think? Much more than, than trying to explain everything all at once, we've, we've got your entire kind of head dump on the ground and everybody can see all your ideas, can share them, talk about them, evolve your ideas. And that becomes an extremely important part of the process. And those are essentially the tenets um, of, of unique ways. Um, and, um, and, and, and it's, it's about, it's about an evolution of design, you know, that I started studying when I was a teenager and now 20 years on, um, this is kind of the conclusions that I've come to. Um, if, if I borrow from your ideas, um, it's completely by accident and it's completely um, a fact that I stumbled on it just as you did. And, uh, and we are kind of in the same boat. And I think, uh, I think a lot of you can probably um, relate to a lot of this. And, and I, hope, I hope you have uh, ideas for me, uh, you know, in a big way, like how I grow as a, per as a designer and as a person is, is by speaking my ideas and then, and then hearing the responses and reflecting on those. So, so you are all instrumental in, in the growth of, of, of this, this idea and in the growth of each other, I think. So, um, so hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to, to do some of that sharing. And that's the talk portion. So, so, um, so we can, as you can see, it moves on quite rapidly. So we can move into the workshop portion now. Um, I love this workshop. It tends to be the most popular part of this, um, this session. Um, um, you know, calling it the Siri workshop, um, it works really well with Zoom because we've got breakout rooms. So what happens is you get in pairs. Um, you'll be paired up, I think, uh, randomly. And um, in the pair, one person is Siri and one person is a user of Siri. Um, you all know what Siri is, yeah? Siri is Apple's voice user interface. So, um, so it's 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 a uh, it, it's a uh, and even if you don't use it or really know what it is, um, you know I think I think from historical sci-fi movies all the way up to to the more recent news, we can kind of relate to this idea that some interfaces are entirely sonic and are entirely voice based. And so, um, in this in this workshop, one person represents that voice based. Um, system and another person is using it and you just talk to each other. Um, and that first portion goes on for five minutes um, and then we'll come back here and I'll, um, I'll share with you um, the second portion of the workshop. Um, and, and that's kind of it. Um, before, we, uh, before we break into this, I just wanna do a quick um, plug. Um, that you can access my TED Talk um, and, um, and my Twitter feed, which I constantly tweet to. Um, just go to thomasgerard.com and it's all there. Um, and if you need a moment to type it in, um, that's great. Um, and then, um, and that's it. And we'll move into the workshop portion, um, which I believe Meng is going to do the breakout rooms. Am I right? Um, I'm starting them now. So okay. we have almost 24 rooms that are available. Great. And uh, if you somehow do not pair up, uh, let me know. Uh, I will try to, to move you around. Could you possibly provide a link to whatever the topic was if you were getting us to do? I have no idea what Siri is. Uh, Siri, imagine, let's say, uh, I don't know, all say 2000, uh, the movie and it's called. I have no idea. Could you just provide uh, a link to the topic, oh, please? Okay, let's say uh, 
it's just a robot talking to you. So it could be R2D2 or, or um, hmm, what else could be? It's just a machine trying to be a person. So you could actually be the opposite side, you know? So if somebody plays Siri, you can be the, the person that is interacting with Siri. Okay. Does anyone know what is happening right now? I'm lost. Oh, I, I went to a breakout room, breakout room, but nobody was there for a while, so I just popped back in here. Okay. Same with me. I did the same. I was in room seven, and nobody arrived, so I came back. Yeah. Somebody was in room seven, or nobody? I was in room nine. I was in eight. I was in seventeen. <laughs> um, and I didn't get the link thing. I look his name and he's, I got lost. <laughs> so he said, we go to your website and get a plugin. Uh, well, I think he was just telling us that we could uh, access more of his work at oh, thomasgerard.com. I think that was all that he meant. Oh, okay. And the exercise was? Someone is Siri saying instructions and the other one is doing what? <laughs> I didn't get the whole thing either. I, th I, I think that's, I think we're supposed to like improvising on one, yeah, one person will be Siri and the other person will ask the questions of Siri. But okay, well, do you want to do it with the four of us? <laughs> I guess. Sure. <laughs> uh, I just texted him. Who, who would else. like to be Siri? <laughs> I'm an Android user, so I'm not going to volunteer for this. <laughs> <laughs> I could try being Siri for a minute, and then I'll trade off to see how it goes. So I guess it's asking me anything. <laughs> hey, Siri, tell us a joke. <laughs> oh, gosh. Siri doesn't say gosh. <laughs> All right, sorry to interrupt. I have a joint breakout room that popped up. Does anyone else have that? I had it. Um, I don't. And okay. if I click the bottom, John Brooke, it, it is. Oh, 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 okay, okay, I do. Yeah, I do have a joint breakout room now. I think, should we go to those? Sure. Sure, we can give it a try. We can try it. I was still all alone in the breakout room. <laughs> uh, Shelly, I see you speaking, but you're muted. There. Okay. Yeah, I went to the breakout room, but nobody was there. So maybe we got assigned to different breakout rooms. So. And my question to Siri was really, that was like putting you on the spot with tell us a joke. <laughs> <laughs> 
I also am an Android user, but I mean, I use Hey Google and yeah. things like that. Same thing. Um, well, if, if, uh, what can I do for you today? <laughs> Siri, tell me the weather. The weather is 26 degrees in Calgary right now. What else we ask? <laughs> <laughs> um, Siri, do I have a meetings coming up? Well, that's the question. <laughs> I recommend you check your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> else? What else? Yeah, I didn't understand the exercise. I, I'm not sure of the purpose. Maybe we were just supposed to, like, I guess, so if, if it is unique ways of prototyping, then maybe um this is how we could use just people to to pretend that siri like okay. rather than building a whole siri type and computer answering program we would simulate that by just using a person although okay. the person would have to be a lot more quick-witted than i am <laughs> I yeah so. that's that's a good point that you can do you can test things so simply um, just by having a conversation and then kind of having a review after and saying, you know, is that the information you were looking for with the weather? Did you want the weather in Calgary? Did you want the temperature? Did you want it in Celsius or Fahrenheit? You know, there's all kinds of, you know, different um, things that you can test without, you know, ever writing a line of code or, um, or building anything. Yeah. You could have like a little box and the, the person could be hidden behind a wall answering in place of Siri. So you can kind of get that. Luis that is here. So maybe we should ask him because he just popped in. Yeah. Yeah, Luis, we have nobody in our rooms and we are trying to figure out the exercise together. <laughs> yeah, it seems like they, some, some people drop off right as soon as we got the breakout rooms. So even though I tried to match everybody, it mm -hmm. was really hard to keep uh, everybody connected. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, sometimes you cannot you cannot account for for some people being. You cannot predict behaviors. Yeah, sorry, we're trying to match up everybody. Don't worry. I went. Down, I went and I went and got the host, and so I I quizzed him all kinds on the security of this system. Oh. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Why would you ever want to use it when mm -hmm. you're if, when all this information is being exploited on you? Great. So Evan, are we are we all back now? Can I um, introduce this next part? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Great. So I, I hope I hope that worked for you. Um, you know, I get different responses to that. Some are like. I didn't get that. What was that about? I don't know. Well, don't know. I, you know, I think okay. just the, the first thing, just Thomas, this is Louise uh, from okay. Calgary. The mm -hmm. very first thing is the topic you gave is not a topic that I'm even familiar with. Yeah. It's not, it's not a tool I use. I forbid it in my house. It's actually forbidden in the workplace as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a bit of a challenging one to start off with because it's way out there. Yeah. And, and then I think maybe the age group, I'm, I'm the older age group. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if that impacts being able to ask the questions too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna address all of that for sure. Uh, but with this still a second portion to the workshop. Um, I'll address all the questions in the Q and A for sure. And those are super actually important. I think that because maybe asking how we book something on an airline is a topic we all know as a general big audience. Anyways, that's just my 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 two cents. I didn't know too much on the topic. Yeah. It, this is all about the personal stories and the, the stories that people have about using these technologies is, is what makes it magical, I think. Um, great. Um, so yeah, so I get different responses to that. Some are like, that was, uh, I didn't get that, what we were supposed to do. And others were like, my, my mind just switched, what happened there? And the joke is usually that I say, okay, go ahead then and go on with your life. Um, and, and people kind of want more guidance than that. But I think the aha moments that we can have with, um, with these workshops are super great. And great, okay. And so a second portion to this workshop, um, which will be um, three person breakout rooms, um, you'll have the same 
two roles. One person is Siri and one person is user of Siri. And the third person will be an impartial note taker. Um, you can even just take notes in your notes app or whatever on your computer, but just take notes about the conversation that's happening between the other two people. Um, you don't have to participate in the conversation, just kind of write down what you observe. Um, and, you know, in a way this transforms it into research, I think, which is interesting. Um, but I think this is just as fun. Um, we'll do it for five minutes again, and um, we'll uh, do it in groups of three. Um, so again, one person is Siri, one person is a user of Siri, and one person is a note taker, and we'll come back in five minutes. Sorry, are we just supposed to talk about anything? Is there any topic or we just talk randomly? Ask Siri anything? I think that's kind of the, the fun of it is that there is, there is the, the, I, I don't provide onboarding. So, um, so what could come out of it could be completely random, but um, in those stories that we tell, I think, I think we'll, we'll, we'll learn a lot. Thanks. Okay. Can we do uh, great? Only room seven is going to have only two people. Oh. Oh, one minute. Though, if you didn't know, we are joining to different rooms, so. We have not met some help. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Good. I was the first breakout. I was all by myself in a room no. a couple of times. And this time I was with two people, but they were muted and their video was off. And I tried chatting to them and there was no response. Oh so my God. Okay. <laughs> it's, oh, it's fine. Okay. No worries. 
Uh, but excellent. anyway, I um, came back. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to join another group or do you want to stay? It's going to be sure, one sure. I can, I can join another group. Okay, let me get you to where Thomas is so you can see that in, in action. So Thanks. he's turned one. No worries, no, thank you for your patience. All right, let me send it over. So we just have a quick banter, some, something to ask you to move the two of them. Okay. All right, we're all back. Just waiting for the rest of the people to join. Well, did the breakout room go itself? Okay, I guess we're all here. And we're all back, okay. Okay, so, so fun, bizarre, confusing, all of the above, none of the above. I always get different responses and I'm, I always have fun running this um, workshop. And, um, and I'm glad that you're here to, uh, to run it with. Um, I, I do wanna open the floor for questions and answers. And again, they can be related to the talk or, 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 or on, on your own personal interest areas. Um, but um, can we go into the Q and A uh, and, and I think what we're doing is we're taking questions in the chat and then um, responding in that way. Um, am I right on that here? Yeah, if you feel comfortable, man can also prompt, prompt you to, to share video and uh, microphone. Or uh, if you feel like uh, there's a, converse, a conversation that needs to be a bit more private, you can also send a private message to me. Um, so, Lewis, do you want to be the one to, to pick the questions? Is that is that what we're doing? Oh, that's Meng. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, maybe we need to start with some questions. Anybody has a, a, anything you would like to ask to Thomas? OK, maybe I'll just jump into the chat here. So it says, Thomas, can Siri call the kids to go downstairs to eat dinner? El, El Waza. I hope I got that right. And I tried to make uh, the best scenario work. Um, you know, these are, these are, these are, <laughs> I'm actually thinking about that, if it would actually work or not, but actually that's kind of not the point. The point is like that when we, when we do these workshops and we probe up technologies like Siri, we, we, we answer a range of questions um, in a big part, what Unique Ways is about is about a really low fidelity way of doing things, and um, and 
um, or even what, what I call a no fidelity way of doing things. And, um, and, and it's not only that, I mean, it can be used throughout a design process, but I think like um, it, it kind of naturally exists in a low fidelity way. And so, um, so when, we, when we use it with Siri and we have these questions, um, um, we start to wonder certain questions that maybe other kinds of prototyping wouldn't reveal. And everybody knows that low fidelity prototyping works in that way. It addresses certain kinds of questions and not others. Um, but I always find it fascinating to see the questions that do come up. So like, I think, you know, asking, asking about, um, asking about our kids and dinner, I think, you know, that's, that's like applying it to, to, to everyday situations. And it's super interesting to, to wonder if it'll work or not that way. Um, Okay, and I've got our group rocked, El Waza and Antonio. Uh, glad to hear that. And um, usually I use the hand raise function, but I think what we're doing is using the chat. Um, can I ask a question, actually, because I was in your group, Thomas, for the note takers, um, is it really important that you remain completely, like you s type as it's said when you're gathering the information? Is that a question from, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I th that's for the note takers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did we have any other note takers here that uh, want to join in on this? Well, I'm Louise, I was a note taker. And one of the things we do in our group, in our UI UX group is that we have a person that's asking the questions and we also have an observer or the note taker and we record the meeting, but I will jot down some quick notes and we don't change the person that we're interviewing. We don't change what they're saying. So we take it verbatim. I think, you know, to jump in on that, I think that's a, that's a great way. And I think that's a traditional way. I like, I like the Rosenfeld books and I like the A Book Apart books and the way that they talk about research methods and the ordinary ways of doing UX research. And I think being that objective, impartial note taker can be really useful and really important and is a, definitely a traditional way of doing things. And not just a traditional way, but a really good way, actually. Um, you know, I, I teach UX here in Vancouver right now. And Sometimes my students, you know, are carried away with it. And one person is the note taker, but they're, they're having fun. They're all talking to each other. And the notes end up being this kind of garbled spaghetti thing at the end. And, and I like that too. You know, it's fun seeing a person's personality in there too. You know, is that, is that, is that the professional way to do it? Probably not. Um, but does something else come out of that? Definitely. Um, so I, I'm very open to like different ways. You bring Personally. up a really good point because what we do do from that is we will have a jam session afterwards of, how, of interpretation of what we heard. And we do use a Trello board to put user requests down. So very specific functions of what our software can and can't do. And so we take, because we will interview up to 10 people when we're gathering this information. And we do have what we call a jam session afterwards of how we interpret people's information because we take it verbatim, but then we have an interpretation meeting, which I find really fun because it's interesting. We'll have two observers and a note taker and the observers can jam anything down that they want, that, that wildness side, because out of that blue blocks thinking, sometimes we've really been able to come up with some information, some things that we never even thought of. So I really recommend to have that piece too. Because yeah, even though a user has it, will they be willing to pay for it? Absolutely. I think the the focusing on the 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 upsides of the qualitative, hearing the stories that people tell, asking the open-ended questions, those are extremely important and extremely revealing. Um, there are some researchers that say that if you hear the stories of 100 people and 80 of them say one thing, then you've got some, some result from that. But I don't think that way at all. I think everybody's unique and has a unique story. And I like to hear each one individually. I do think that's important. But I think that's a bit of a, 
uh, uh, fairy tale for some people. I think some people want to get to the nuts and bolts and the results. Thanks for that. That was great. Um, other questions or thoughts here? I'm just looking at the uh, chat. So one person got into an empty room, unfortunately, I'm sorry about that, um, but wants to hear the intentions of the exercise. I think the intentions are, um, you know, now having run this many times and reflecting on it, I do think that it is in a big way about talking about low fidelity and talking about what we can do. Um, obviously, you know, cost always comes into it and like, oh, you can run, you can have a conversation. It doesn't cost anything except the people's time. So let's do it that way and see what results we can come from it. Other people say we need something much higher fidelity or we need a finished version or something like that, or at least we need some Figma or XD thing. And I'm like, well, yes, I know. I mean, everything gives you different kinds of feedback. Do I think that a role play workshop um, with a conversation covers all the bases? No, um, but do I think it's useful in revealing? Yes. So I think my intentions is to show that it's useful in revealing to even just have a conversation and that is user experience and that is design in the frame of unique ways of prototyping. I have a question. How, how yeah. would you fit that in, in a regular project? Let's say, would you do that before even start prototyping or as a way to clarify a, any sort of discovery? Or what, what, when is the perfect time to bring it in? Absolutely. I think, I think it can happen at any time. You know, at, when I gave this at the Vancouver User Experience Research Meetup, a bunch of hands came up at the end and said, we already do this. We do this in our in our everyday work, and I was very happy to hear that. Like that's that's a great result. Um, yeah, I always get people who are hearing about it for the first time, and they ask, you know, when it, when do we do it? We just do it at the beginning, or 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 what? But I think like kind of moving back to the modalities idea. I think you can move from low fidelity to high fidelity, then back to low fidelity again. And I think as you move in that way, it's equally important. I don't think you move from a basic way to something more detailed to something finished. I think you actually move between those, not in a linear way, but um, but between those in a, in a very different way. I think you can get new insights by doing the role play, making a high fidelity um, prototype, and then going back to the role play. I think your role play session after that can be very revealing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, uh, about participants, would you suggest uh, a Beam a Siri or a, on the question side, uh, a, any particular role or, or experience? Let's say maybe bring in a, a, a stakeholder, a product owner, or a user to, to play one particular role or the other? I think that's a great question. I think, yeah, please feel free, don't, don't be shy to jump in on the conversation. I think a big conversation can be great um, if that's the direction we wanna go in. I have a question. Um, we're towards the end of it. Where does Adobe XD come into play? Cause that's part of the title was the unique ways of prototyping in Adobe XD. So what would be the response? Like all the can, can, all those, uh, you know, UX uh, software, you know, US, you know, prototyping making softwares. Like what's the one that's online only? What's the name again? F Figma. There we go. I think XD is uh, XD is a sponsor. Am I right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I use XD, of course, in in teaching UX, and in addition to to ideas around unique ways of prototyping. Um, are they connected? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would say kind of return to the original idea that um, it's an additional project. Ob obviously, the XD ends up being um, moving towards the higher fidelity. And I think moving between the spaces of a conversation to the XD and then from the XD, having something quite finished and moving back to a conversation can actually be a useful step. You know, the, the argument is always that using something like XD is a little bit time consuming. And if, you, if small changes are asked to be made of the XD prototype, then 
um, that can sometimes be time consuming or, or not give you the right result. And sometimes moving back to a conversation um, will fix a lot of those kinds of feedback that don't make sense to just kind of incrementally change your XD prototype. Um, I think to me, the, you know, I think, I think XD is there because they're a sponsor, but I think XD is for me is, is one modality is one space uh, and, and uh, another space is the role play conversation. And I think you can move back and forth between them. Is it okay if I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about, I, I'm, essentially self-taught and I'm working with a startup and I'm trying to, to, to do some of this research and we're working with users and we've built different prototypes. One of the things I, I always wonder, and I, I'm sure there's no final answer, but love, would love to hear input from everybody, is how do you know you've done enough testing? Like, how do you know, like, how can you feel comfortable with whatever it is you think you've discovered on the basis of your testing? And I'm just curious to hear, you know, what's the you know, what's the line of reasoning or the rationale or, you know, do you have any guideposts in terms of, you know, what do I know and how well do I know it and should I act on that? Yeah, I can definitely answer that. Um, for me, you know, with unique ways of prototyping, um, you know, honestly, we get to the user testing as quickly as we can. We create prototypes for the purpose of testing, not for the purpose of creating that artifact. And we test as long as we have time for. Um, when we run out of time, that's when we've done enough testing. You know. There are a lot of great um, thinkers who have have ideas around this. There's one great example with lean customer discovery, where you know it's a it's a it's a description, and the the the, the designer says, "Oh, I've talked to five or six people. I think I've done it." And the client says, "No, go talk to more people." And then he's like, "I talked to 25 people. I have it for sure." And then the the client's like, "No, go talk to more people." And it kind of keeps going on and on like that. Um, saying that that more and more testing is useful. Um, I, I think that way and personally, you know, with my own processes, I tend to use the interviews a lot rather than the surveys um, and other research methods. So I think um, I think you know as much as you have time and budget for you should do it. Obviously it's hard to it can be hard to convince people early on of these kinds of methods and processes. Um, Outside of, of unique ways of prototyping, there's a great Rosenfeld book called User Experience Team of One that talks a lot about how if you're the only user experience person in a company, you can, you can, um, you can, um, you can implement it and you can, you can get buy-in um, quite easily um, to, 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 to be afforded the time to do these kinds of activities um, and to be able to show the value of doing them. Um, but to me, like you can keep testing with people and you can always reveal new insights and that, that's always useful. Right, fair enough. My only observation from the, the series, well, not only observation, like one of many, but you know, I think Louise may have touched on it a little bit. One of the takeaways was because it was so open-ended, you know, we hadn't established sort of intent, you know, what were we testing and what were we hoping to learn? Um, and my takeaway was really that, like, unless you do that, you know, you go into it and you certainly learn a lot. Right. But you know, my biggest takeaway was, oh, we, we probably should have set that up front and then we would have gotten more out of that testing. Right. And so in a lot of cases, some of the testing I've done has been the same. Right. It's like, well, we did this test, but really we should have tested something else. Or really what we uncovered was the fact that, you know, we didn't didn't define it very well. Or we didn't set it up the right way. So. Yeah, for me, um, for me, I, 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 like I said in the beginning, I like tangents, and you know, I like to see my projects evolve. You know, I like to know my audience and know who I'm designing for, and then based on that understanding, choose something to design for them. What that means is that sometimes I can be working on one app idea, for example, and abandon it completely in favor of something new that serves the needs of the user and of the audience better than what I was initially creating. I can actually, um, I can actually abandon ideas and move on to new ideas. Um, and I think, I don't know if that's widely accepted or not, I think, but I think, I think you can do it with unique ways of prototyping and that can be an advantage of it. Um, you know, um, I would say, I would say obviously, 
you know, t as a teacher in the academic set setting, that works a lot better. And it can be difficult if, to tell your client that the project you've been working on for um, for for several months is 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 no longer the best project for these people. Um, but you know, um, if you talk to the top UX thinkers. Um, many of them focus on understanding people and creating the best thing for them. And what that means is you're not wedded to a technology or you're not wedded to an app idea and you can discard it. There are many projects that get discarded along the way, even in big tech. I mean, Facebook's a great example of a company that experiments a lot with um, funding projects within the Facebook umbrella um, 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 pushing on them for a while and then realizing they're not the best thing and, and just abandoning them. And, you know, many companies have, have research labs where they do things like this. I think, I think, I think this idea that we've got to make the best thing for our people is, is, is the key to this. And, um, and, and, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's my thoughts on that. Well, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and great to see Louise, your comment as well. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, we, we do need to find people that we can sort of bounce our, our process off of. And the challenge is find people who, I guess, want to get tactical, right? Because it's easy to say, hey, we got to do interviews. But what I'm finding is it's the details of, you know, what you ask and how you ask actually make or break it, right? And so just getting someone to look at and say, oh, you're doing interviews, that's great. But, you know, it's probably more a question of getting experience to sort of walk alongside and say, oh, you know, you could have asked this question differently or, yeah. Absolutely. I would say look at the Rosenfeld Library and look at the Oboka Part Library. There are books about specific questions to ask in, a, in an interview, specific environments to do the interviews in, how to choose who you're going to interview, things like that definitely are, are thought about a lot in the UX sphere. Um, okay. Yeah, and you can, you, can you can find answers to those questions there. Great. Thank you. Any more thoughts or questions? I'm glad to... Uh, to keep this going. Oh, we've got a hand raise here. Um, Sam. Yeah. Um, hi, Thomas. Hi. Oh, so um, my question um, is, uh, I just want to know, uh, what's the essence of um, using um, different software to do your prototype when you can actually um, have your prototype done on one software and it's going to give you a good result? Um, because I noticed um, some people do do um, do try to make some ammunition on different platforms and get it done back to XD. Because as for me, I like um, I love using XD. I use XD for all my designs. So, um, but uh, my clients, my boss, do always want me to use um, Butterfly, use other software. So, what's the essence of um, using other software for you for you to for you to prototype when you know that you can use um, one software to achieve your, your, um, your goal? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that, Sam. Um, so I think, you know, I think um, each software is essentially a modality as well. You know, the, one software might focus very nice on a, a delicate um, transitions and motion. And, and that will be a focus of your prototype when you present it. And, you know, that's great and it can look beautiful and it can wow people. But if you're trying to get feedback about information architecture or flows or something like that, it might not um, communicate, it might not uh, receive that kind of feedback. Um, and instead it might draw attention to other areas like visual design. I think each kind of software has strengths and weaknesses and you need to, you, you need to choose um, your software based on the kinds of feedback that you're wanting to get and the kinds of changes that you're wanting to implement um, within your project. Um, yeah, you can, do, you can do one prototype in one great software program, Figma or XD, for example, and you can have a great result and it can look beautiful. But what is a great result, right? The great result is if you're, isn't, isn't the great result if you're reaching your users or not? Isn't the great result um, something that you have to define and um, measure, um, you know, or, or is it just a wow factor? Um, perhaps if you're presenting to a, a single client or something like that, if you're in a entrepreneur a startup situation or working with an entrepreneur or something like that, then maybe you only have one person who you need to get buy-in from and, and it can be a lot simpler. 
um, but often you know you have more users than one um, for <laughs> for your project I mean you need to consider the different kinds of people um, that you um, are making for and what their needs are um, rather than just creating something beautiful or even something that's just functional I hope that answers yeah thank you thank you my pleasure We've got a question. I'm just reading here. Just got a comment here uh, about uh, Google UX Design Professional course um, and um, and 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 involvement in that. Yeah, I think I think I think all of the design education routes and the UX education routes are really and can reveal new things. Um, even during my time teaching interaction design at Emily Carr, I, I kind of went back to being a student and did, tried a boot camp thing and found the ideas were very similar to what I was teaching already, but that was good too. That kind of gave me a bit of, um, a bit of um, um, confirmation or affirmation that what I was doing made sense, not just to me, but to other people as well. So I think this kind of progression of keeping learning, keeping attending the meetups, keeping attending the, um, the uh, hackathons and implementing your ideas and testing them is great. And I think we can always grow as UX designers. Um, I've got a hand from Sam Jane here. Hi, uh, thanks for answering our question. I just wanted to know, uh, uh, I joined this meeting late, so is there any recorded session for this meeting? Yeah. Yes. So I will send you some links so everybody can join later. Awesome, thank you. Great. So um, are we okay for time, Lewis? How does this work? Uh, well, if you want to, uh, maybe we can cover Alana's question as a final question and then some final remarks and uh, everybody can continue with it. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, which question? I, I can think mine. <laughs> Hi, Thomas, thanks for taking the time. Great, yeah, no, thank you. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, I just was curious if you had any thoughts on uh, customer discovery and moving in and out of those kind of no or low fidelity modalities um, and kind of anonymity of people. Um, what I've found is that in some of my customer discovery is that when the conversation is more on an anonymous level, um, that it's much easier for people to answer very vulnerable type questions. And that once the, once there's some kind of, um, like say for example, if I try to ask my friends the same uh, questions, that they're less uh, open and forthright in answering those questions than a complete stranger. And I've considered that uh, perhaps uh, moving to a higher fidelity uh, setting where it's not a, an interaction, like a personal interview type setting, um, that that might let people be more anonymous and answer, you know, in a, in a more sort of honest and, and personal way. Anyway, it, kind of an obscure question, but but definitely something that just sort of keeps popping up in, in my line of um, customer discovery. Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, um, and it actually makes me think, because on campus right now, we have these posters up um, with pens hanging there and a question written on it. And so nobody watches and you can just write whatever you want, kind of like graffiti or something like that. You can answer these UX related questions if you're just a person walking walking by in the hall. And I think the, um, the anonymous aspect of that encourages people to be authentic and not just authentic, but a little bit um, violent. <laughs> not in a bad way, like in an open way. Um, you know, another aspect, you know, like how I would probably normally answer that is that 
like with with unique ways of prototyping I, and with my own kind of undergraduate education in communication design such a long time ago, um, I did feel like like ever since I was a teenager, I was um, I was encouraged to to have empathy, to be empathetic naturally because that's a trait of a designer. And um, and I think now I think when I do user testing, there's probably quite a bit of improvisation just based on based on my em empathy, my understanding of empathy and 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 how I can um, implement it. The other thing is there is not. I mean, there's a lot of UX literature, but I think there are still big gaps. And I think we don't have all of the answers in our in our commonplace mainstream. Um, um, information sources around UX. I mean, we're still looking at Nielsen Norman Group, which you know kind of pioneered the first ideas around this. I mean, I think, I think, I, and you know, and and also um, industry is 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 such a, a breeding ground for new and good ideas when traditionally industry doesn't do that. And so I think that just shows that that everybody has so much to learn about UX and it does require some feeling your way through and it does require different processes and methods. Um, with unique ways of prototyping, I'm not trying to replace other ideas and say discount them or something like that. I'm just kind of offering my way as a, as a, as a personal journey that, that, that revealed certain results for me and might reveal results for you. Uh, I wouldn't say like don't do this or don't do that because you're doing this. I think, I think add it to your tools, tools, add it to your skill set. Um, even just tangentially think about it once in a while, um, and, and keep doing things your way for sure. I think, I think, and I think there are many ways of user testing, and user testing is extremely important. And I think that um, there's not enough, um, there's not enough. Um, out there about it in a common way. And I think a lot of your, your comments about customer experience and about ways of testing and about what reveals what are, are, are totally accurate. And I can def definitely relate to, to a lot of those. And I would say, I would say um, you know, they're probably great ideas that, that I should run with more as well. Um, and and, and, and kind, of, kind, of, kind of probe and understand um, um, in my personal journey through through UX and through evolving unique ways of prototyping. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm basically saying, yeah, you're right. Um, not enough people know that and keep doing that because it sounds like your process is really revealing. Yeah, it, it, I didn't expect to get a uh, definitive answer, but so much to say. Have you noticed this too? Because uh, it, it's just very interesting how um, kind of the, the medium of communication can, can change uh, the types of, say, answers and authenticity and relatability that you get with uh, an interview. Yeah, you know, um, you know, when I was teaching at Emily Carr, I, I taught it basically a very vocational program and we're placing people in industry. And some people were getting placements in, in places that I could never have, 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 have gotten into, perhaps because they had a business background already or something like that. Um, I had people going into service design and definitely had um, a valuable and strong opinions about um, how that worked um, that I could probably integrate more into what I do. Um, I think, yeah, that's one of the great things about UX is that you can you can go into a, into, into a subset of UX. You can go into a specialty and, and learn all sorts of new things that, uh, that apply to that and probably apply to other things as well. Um, you know, I, I know I'm kind of glossing over your question. I think, I think, I think it's really valuable. And I think, um, and I think, I think, yeah, I think as unique ways of prototyping evolves, I think um, there, there will be a time when, when I deep dive into, into topics like yours. Thanks. Thank you, yeah. Um, great, and we're at 12.15, so what are we thinking here? Well, I guess uh, for us, uh, uh, maybe the best way to tie up the conversation is, uh, well, sharing that what would be the best way to keep in touch with you, to continuously looking at what you have been doing and uh, 
if there are any if there is any further questions uh, addressed in a maybe private or public manner so what would be the best way to, to reach out to you yeah visit my personal website at thomasgerard.com um, you can find my book there and my tedx talk there it's a two-minute ted talk it's been translated into 18 languages so i think it's great for everyone and you can watch that and see if you want to learn more about me if you liked this session or some aspects of it, um, my book does cover um, my personal journey, um, giving this talk workshop um, and all of the kind of insights that I found out, things that made it right, things that made it wrong. Um, it's kind of all in there. I would definitely encourage you to, if you have a, if you, a couple extra dollars to pick up a copy or, or the, the, the ebook is uh, also available there. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, um, please reach out to me. Um, um, definitely DM me on Twitter. I, I like the one-on-one -on -one personal um, connections and personal discussions. I think so much comes out of those and I very much welcome those. Don't feel intimidated about, about making contact. Um, just reach out to me. I'm glad to, uh, to start conversations. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Certainly, some of us will, will keep in touch. And uh, as always, uh, I cannot say thank you enough to Thomas and to Men for, for sharing this time with us and to everybody on the, on the call for uh, spending your, your lunchtime and uh, learning more about unique ways uh, of prototyping. And uh, well, what can I say for me? I just want to share some uh, next events that are coming up. And also uh, some of that information will be shared with you with the link once we get that uh, video recording out. Uh, most likely that's going to be shared on a meetup or on, in our Slack channel. And uh, yeah, for our next events, we're going, to have a, we're going to have a partnership with the Developer Week. And if you haven't picked your ticket, uh, we have 25 free tickets available. So if anybody is interested, they can join. And um, the promo code will be shared with you. It's uh, over here, but I will send it over with that email. Also, we are a, yeah, we are partners of Savvy uh, UX Summit. And uh, yeah, they are only have like a 2% available uh, uh, tickets. So if you haven't picked your ticket, uh, hey, maybe it's time to, to get that. And uh, in our Slack channel, we share the, the promo code to get a discount, but if you haven't really uh, seen it or you're not part of it, please reach out to me and I will send the, the promo code to you too. And also we're going to be part of design conferences by learners. And uh, this is also happening almost in the same weekend as in, of September. So yeah, just uh, I, I guess uh, we're going to have quite a lot of information coming our, our way. And uh, this case, uh, these conferences are free and the Calgary UX is going to have a a spot in those conferences. So I hope you can make it. It's going to be on Friday. And uh, our next event is uh, is a partnership with the General Assembly. They are coming over and helping us to bring the kind of topics and, and speakers that we normally would not know because we are not really far reaching on, on their side. So this time we're going to talk to Kushar and uh, his uh, take on UX gaming design threats. And uh, yeah, it's going to be happening at the end of the month. So we have quite a lot of great information happening in September. And uh, please join us. Uh, I hope you can, you, you make it to this uh, workshop and you stay with us because you like the community. And for everybody that uh, this is the first time that uh, you met us, uh, please feel free to reach us in, in many different ways. So uh, we have our website, uh, Twitter, or if you find more comfortable, if you're more comfortable with the Slack, uh, we can also send you our Slack uh, link. And that's, that's all for me, you know. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, yeah, as soon as I have the possibility to send you the link, I will send you all the information all together. And uh, yeah, thank you for your patience for anybody that wasn't a match up directly. I hope uh, you had a, a great uh, value coming up from this conversation. And if not, uh, please share that comment with me and I will try to find a ways to, to to give you more information or context so, so you have more you you have more value out of uh, Thomas conversation and uh, thank you all and just uh,
going to stop the recording. I don't know how to stop the recording. Okay, stop recording. Yes. Thank you so much, Thomas. How, how are you doing? Thanks, Thank I'm you. great. Thanks for, thanks for that. Thanks for running that. That was great. Oh, wow. Thank you for coming up to the community and, and spending some time with us. And uh, yeah, for all the help on, on promoting it and trying to, to get the word out. That's really nice. Thank you. My pleasure. Really glad to, to, uh, to join. Uh, anything we can do uh, to, to help you or support anything that uh, you're doing? Um, no, just let me know. Uh, keep me in, informed about, you know, about the recording for this session would be great. I would love to be able to link to that or point people to that Absolutely. who couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, and what else? Um, um, yeah, just uh, uh, keep me in the loop with future events. Um, let me know. Yeah, I guess how to stay in touch is right here. Um, I've been uh, I've been trying to figure out how to stay in touch, and it looks like it's all here. So oh, that's well. great. <laughs> yeah, we, we are well. I can see you're already in, already in Slack and LinkedIn. Yeah. But if there's anything else, yeah, I'm always happy to help. And uh, yeah, well, what can I say? I hope you have a really great rest of your day. I think you are you're still going to have to go to classes or. or that's right. Yeah. yeah interesting. Yeah, yeah, right. So yeah. yeah, I hope we don't get too tired for the next part uh -huh. of the afternoon. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to awesome. head out. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you, Meng. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, let, let me know how, how okay. if you get any good news on your side. Sorry. Oh, like let me know if you, if you get any good news or any other uh, yeah. responses from no, good. But Sorry that I wasn't too useful, but I'm glad that it has become a really nice conversation the end of it awesome. yeah well that, that's good to hear no worries we're, we're going to have many opportunities to to find our our good rhythm for moderating and uh, yeah sometimes with workshops it's complicated right because you don't know exactly how, how people are going to react or if they're going to stay or they're going to leave but let's see yeah thanks for another great event another participant just told me that she prefers calgary ux much better than edmonton ux uh, <laughs> well, we're not. <laughs> it's not a competition where we're partners, you know. So, so I feel like you're talking to your brother. It's but... No, it's not a competition. But no, uh, thanks for the events. That's the mm, message. My pleasure. Yeah, Crazy. yeah. I actually, I actually like uh, Calgary event also. I, I like the uh, the articles. It's so great. Oh, there you go. That's so great to hear that. That yeah, that hits me right here. <laughs> <laughs> all right well you you all, you all make these events right I just uh, turn on the zoom and, and you bring the, the energy so thank you thank you for joining and uh yeah what can yeah. i say next time okay. okay okay bye bye, -bye.